Helena Blavatsky is one of the most significant figures in occultism, and she got her start in America. Well, not her actual start. She was born in the Ukraine, but she came to America to co-found the Theosophical Society, an organization that would spread across the globe in search of a mystical union between Eastern and Western religious ideas, digging beneath the surface for an original set of beliefs and practices to unite everyone. Originally, the society was concerned with experiments in practical occultism. Blavatsky herself was skilled in performing a variety of occult feats. Henry Steele Alcott, who co-founded the society with her, heard disembodied taps, witnessed pictures and letters materialize, and even saw her hair lengthen and shorten through mysterious means. Blavatsky claimed to be a chela, or disciple, of a secret mystical order of occult adepts based in Egypt. Eventually, she shifted her allegiance from these masters to a new order of adepts located in India and Tibet. These masters projected their spirits across continents and oceans to communicate with Blavatsky and Alcott, and they used their supernatural ability to materialize notes and letters directing Blavatsky's activities. Under their influence, Blavatsky composed a blockbuster work of occultism, the rambling and controversial Isis Unveiled, in which she attacked Christianity as a poor derivative of a more pure Eastern religious tradition and argued that science was failing humanity humanity by refusing to acknowledge the profound mysteries of occult phenomena. There is a lot to say about Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and we won't be able to say it all in a single episode, but we want to introduce you to her today by tracking her career from the Ukraine to America to the founding of her Theosophical Society. In other words, we're devoting our time today to analyzing Blavatsky's time as an American occultist before leaving for Europe and India. Like Pascal Beverly Randolph, she was an outsider, an immigrant with strange ideas. Also like Randolph, she claimed to have been inspired and guided by secret brothers hailing from distant shores. My name is Dr. Rob C. Thompson with my uh, PhD in things occult, the supreme hierophant of our secret order of alchemical actors. I am joined by our grand master of ceremonies, Olivia Litterall. All, wait, of ceremonies? Is that normal? Well, it, it's all ceremonies. Oh, okay. It's just longer and fancier now. Well, I'll get used to it. I'm just trying that out. Just, okay. Hey, It's a second episode. We'll yeah. see how it feels. Feeling frisky. <laughs> uh, and joining us for the first time, I'd like to introduce you to Savannah Verrett. Hello, everyone. What's up? Um... I listening to your intro and it sounds like Helena Blavatsky uh, is like the queen of hot takes. <laughs> She's fighting Christianity and science. Well, that's incredible. Yeah, that's <laughs> queen of 19th century hot takes. Yeah, because science and Christianity were like the masters of the 19th century. Now it's sort of just science. Yes, but normally when you attack Christianity, you use science. So it's interesting <laughs> to attack both. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So, that's true. All right, let's have at the pledge, shall we? Mm. We, um, the members, members of the, of the secret, secret order, order, secret of, order alchemical of alchemical actors, actors do solemnly do commit, commit ourselves, ourselves to, to a full honest honest and honest telling, and honest telling of the history, history of the occult as, as, far, as far as we know it. it. <laughs> that was ambitious. I feel like that was weird, but I, I think I like repeated words. I don't know. <laughs> no, I felt, I felt, I felt together-ish. Okay. <laughs> Close enough. Helena Blavatsky was born in August of 1821 in Ekaterinoslav, Ukraine. Her mother was a writer and a translator of novels. Her father had a military career and moved the family around quite a bit. Helena was the oldest, with two younger siblings, Vera, who also became a writer, and Leonid. Who is Leonid? It's her brother, yeah. It's a good okay. person. Yeah, it's her brother. Ah. Her mother died when she was only 11, and when she was 18, she married the much older Nikofor Blavatsky uh, on a bet with her governess that she couldn't find a man who would tolerate her. That's so rude. What? Wow. Yeah. Well, good for her. She beat that bet. Well, I mean, it was kind of up to... It was, it's a bad thing to... You shouldn't bet a person that they won't do a thing that they can just go out and do. Yeah, that just makes them want to do it, right? Pretty, pretty much. <laughs> oh. yeah. At least for me. <laughs> 
in this case, she probably should have withheld. She should have yeah. just let the governess win. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into that. So her husband became the governor of the province. So that's pretty cool. But she refused him his, uh, I'll put this in air quotes, marital rights. Yes, you got me winking. queen. You yeah. got me? Yes. Uh, and she ran away, uh, eventually boarding the Commodore. Uh, and the Commodore is, is a boat, not a, not a guy. Oh, sh- wow. Okay. okay. I wasn't even. But she kept his last name? Uh, yes. Yeah. As it turns that's out. That's interesting. It's a very 19th century thing to do. Okay. She gave her servants the slip in Kursk and continued on by herself to Constantinople. The what? The slip in Kursk? I I was just listening to that. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just listening to that song earlier today. I don't know if that's a good one. Copyright, but. (laughs) <laughs> she, I think you're good. You can do a few notes. Yeah. She next traveled to Cairo in search of alchemical secrets and then took up the piano and considered becoming a professional pianist, giving concerts in England and on the continent. Which is like a side quest for her. Yeah, she was she's just <laughs> that skill, good. Side skill, okay. <laughs> These were like her college years, her trying to find herself. Yeah. Being a concert pianist, yeah. <laughs> uh, an Indian delegation attended the Great Exhibition at Hyde Park in 1851, and according to biographer Sylvia Cranston, it's likely she met the first of her occult masters there and then. This is the, the masters that form this secret brotherhood who, who guide her. The Indian occultist instructed her to study in Tibet for three years to prepare to help him with a great work they would undertake together. And so began Blavatsky's first world tour. She began in America, which is the wrong way to get to Tibet, (laughs) seeking to communicate with American Indians and also Mormons. Savannah, you have a, a love for Mormons, isn't that right? I do. I think Mormons are incredible people i i am fascinated by their religion <laughs> are, are you are you at all concerned that they might be knocking on your door now um well i would listen but it's going to take some convincing mormons i'm sorry i will i it's interesting but i yeah <laughs> you're more a fan from the outside you like looking Eesh. from a yes. distance you'll listen okay. through the door <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> Just slide the book under the door. She traveled to New Orleans, Texas, Mexico, and Honduras before leaving for Ceylon, which is a country we now call Sri Lanka, and finally Bombay. Can we pause real fast? Um, how, how How is she traveling so much? Where is she getting the money to travel? She's a resourceful woman, but initially she did have a certain amount of like family money she could work off of. She got an allowance. Oh, okay. That's going to run out eventually, but at this From stage... From her husband or her, like, family? Like, eh, little column family. A, little column B. Oh, okay. She can run away from her husband and still get money from him? She, that's the beauty of Blavatsky. That's a power but, um, move right there. This sounds like something I want to do. <laughs> that's true, yeah. You need <laughs> to like go back optimal... to the 19th century. Yeah. There you go. British officials turned her away at the border of Tibet, and she did another round trip around the world to New York, Chicago, South America, and finally Calcutta. So that's really two trips to America and then India. She returned home long enough to learn that Nikofor had given up his marital rights entirely uh, and to impress her family with mediumistic taps, which she claimed to produce by occult power and not the spirits of the dead. So at this time period, a lot of spiritualists in America in particular and then moving into Europe were communicating with dead people. And the way they did it wasn't like the Long Island medium where they, you know, hear the voices and tell you about it. There would actually be taps on tables or under tables that were being produced by no hands that you could see like disembodied hands and they would tap out like a morris code oh interesting you know maybe the long island can't read morse code like or maybe (laughs) ghosts nowadays just don't know morse code so she has to hear their voices (laughs) that's possible Um, so Blavatsky, though, she was a little different because she said she was also able to produce these taps just like the mediums in America. But she said, that's not dead people. That's my oh. own occult power making that happen. Whoa. So after staying in Europe for a while, she headed for Tibet in 1868, where she stayed for an indeterminate amount of time with two occult masters. The first one was Mahatma Moria and the second one was Kuthumi. Ooh, Kuthumi. Good old coot. 
It rolls off the tongue. It does. <laughs> Whether or not this sojourn actually took place is subject to fierce scholarly debate. Uh, the biographer Cranston identifies three points of evidence that suggests she was really there, and I'll leave it to our listeners to make up their minds whether or not they, they hold these to be convincing enough. The first one uh, is that D.T. Suzuki, the Japanese Zen master who brought Zen Buddhism to the West and had considerable knowledge of Tibet, believed, based on what he knew of what she'd written, uh, that she had been there. So he was convinced just based on his study of her. The second piece of evidence is that Blavatsky translated the Tibetan Buddhist The Voice of Silence in 1889. This was a book that was praised by our current Dalai Lama. And the last What was it about? It's well, I can't it's the voice of silence. Oh. Hmm. Says it all. Okay. <laughs> I haven't actually I'm read fine. that one. I've read uh, many of her books, but I've not read that one. Uh, And an investigator staying in Tibet in the 1920s received reports of a woman named Blavatsky staying in and around the country. Probably that's the most persuasive, but it's just this one guy. So (laughs) there you go. But that guy, like his neighbors are like, that's the most credible guy I've ever met in my life. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's a very specific thing to say there was a Blavatsky around here. What are the odds? Yeah. Right. In Tibet. Next, we hear of Blavatsky. She's one of only 16 passion- passengers to survive an explosion on board the SS Eunomia sailing for Cairo by way of the Ionian Islands. Kind of Holy amazing. Holy crap! Yeah. <laughs> She's an incredible life. What? Yeah. Uh, then, in June 1873, while staying with a relative in Paris, she suddenly received a message from her occult masters to sail for New York. By all accounts, uh, I-, I really love this story b- about her, uh, because it shows that she was a pretty nice person like she's just generally a nice person to be around on her trip to america she encountered a mother with small children who was missing a ticket for the crossing so blavatsky exchanged her more expensive ticket like you know in the top of the titanic for a couple of cheaper tickets so like you know moving down closer to where leo was doing that irish jig (laughs) so that the woman and her children could make the trip to america Aww. Wow, that is very nice. Oh, yeah. And thank you, Rob, for putting it in terms of the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To remind our listeners, it's 1873. We are like 40, 50 years before the Titanic would sail. Uh, so it was not the Titanic, but just in Titanic terms. <laughs> Uh, In New York, the death of her father cut off her allowance, and she resorted to making men's shirt collars and artificial flowers. So here, Savannah, is where we're no longer making the the family bucks. No more inheritance. Mm. Did they cut her off for a reason? Or the, like, you've just been running around too long? Or was it, like, stop messing with the occult? In part, I think the money was coming from whatever her father was up to, so he was not able to work anymore because he died. Uh, Oh. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Then in 1874, she traveled to Chittenden, Vermont, to look in on the Eddy seances where she met Colonel Henry Alcott. And two oh, years shit. later, yeah, they were holding a nationally publicized funeral for the Baron de Palme. So let me just take a, a quick second for that. The Eddy seances were an interesting event. These two guys, William and Horatio Eddy, uh, William was the materializing medium. He would get behind this curtain in this cabinet. When it came, by cabinet, we mean like a, it's, it, was, it was a closet on, behind a stage and you would wait a little bit and then a spirit would pop out from behind the curtain while Eddie was back there, you know, like meditating and, you know, forcing this ether into the air. And here came this spirit. And he did this. They produced like he produced like 300 different spirits. So this was this was oh, like wow. national news that he could do this. It was also national news because like on the surface of it, it seemed pretty ridiculous. Most people were like. <laughs> Isn't it just that guy, like, putting on costumes back there and popping out? (laughs) Right. (laughs) No. So Henry Alcott uh, was a kind of, like, amateur paranormal investigator with a reasonable reputation. He had actually served on the inquest into Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah, pretty major dude. That's, like, street cred. He wrote a 400-page book about the Eddie seances where he sort of all the whole time was saying that they were a ridiculous waste of time, but... Wow. (laughs) that he couldn't disprove any of the phenomena. So in other words, the Eddies seemed to be doing some like miraculous, you know, unexplainable things, but there was nothing, no significant message that he could take away from it. Like there was nothing <laughs> worth talking about, huh. you know, that any of the spirits had to say or do. They were just like popping out, yeah. performing magic tricks and then disappearing. Hmm. 
So probably what happened was Blavatsky was reading his articles because he was sending out articles about these seances. And there are some folks believe, and we'll never know this, but some folks believe that she thought to herself, oh, this guy, this guy would be the perfect like partner to publicize my new career that I'm going to start as this international occultist. So she went up there to meet him is the how that argument goes to get him in mm. on her whole situation. Uh, and it, I mean, it, she, she succeeded. He was very interested in this woman and he ended up partnering with her, not romantically. They always had a strictly platonic relationship, but to found the Theosophical Society, which would go on to be internationally famous and still exists today. The other thing I want to say is a quick note about the funeral for the Baron de Palme. The Baron de Palme was the first person to be cremated in the United States. And, oh, wow. and he had a theosophical funeral. So the reason he was the first person to be cremated is because the Theosophical Society observed this blend of Western and Eastern traditions, and it was Eastern tradition to cremate bodies. So he was he joined the Theosophical Society sort of right after it was formed and right before he died. So <laughs> his funeral was then another like national event. Just like the Eddie seances, Blavatsky manages to create these great big publicity opportunities for herself. And Alcott gave this big speech. It was this whole thing. Wow. So in 1876 and 1877, Blavatsky was the recording secretary for the Theosophical Society, and she was hard at work on the first of her two significant occult works, which she would produce in her lifetime. And that is Isis Unveiled. The second book is the more uh, sort of like rich book, the more it's the book that people like me tend to admire more, and that was The Secret Doctrine. She was going to write that a decade or more later. So the book, Isis Unveiled, which I have also read a great deal of, is a thousand pages long, and I will vouch oh for God. the fact that it is incredibly difficult to read. She is <laughs> thick. Wow, that is large. <laughs> the, the book pages? or Blavatsky? <laughs> um, I mean... Don't talk about homegirl like that, but yeah. Okay. All right. The book. Yeah. Blavatsky moves from theory to theory and tangent to... She was also not a thin woman, just so our listeners Yeah, know. I know. That's why I said don't talk about homegirl like that. <laughs> I know. There's there's other There are other podcasts who uh, make light of that, but I think that's not, not really like the point. She's not like that. Anyway, okay. Just keep it. Well, she also had a lot of health problems near the end of her life, so it's, it's not entirely fair. Also, women were a lot of layers. I'm just saying. This is true. So, Thick doesn't have to be a bad thing, BT, by the way. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Body positivity here on A Call Confessions. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Isis Unveiled, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> so she moves from theory to theory and tangent to tangent, filling the book with anecdotes and diatribes, which typify a brand of occultism uh, that's not unlike those of some of her peers, including Pascal Beverly Randolph and the Chevalier Louis Deby, somebody we'll get to in our next episode. But more than just being a difficult book, Isis Unveiled is also a fairly remarkable catalog of mainstream and occult philosophers spanning the whole history of Western culture. She attacks atheistic science, attempts to fold Darwin's theories into her own occult theory, blends Eastern mysticism with her own Blavatskyan theosophy, quotes Schopenhauer, and references the Talmud and the Vedas. Whew. That's a mix. She was a busy woman. <laughs> Let's get into some of the ideas now that, that surface in this book. Her views on the soul and the afterlife, in my opinion, are fascinating. To begin, she does not believe that all of us are guaranteed an afterlife. Our souls may or may not survive the tradition, the transition of death. If the human soul has neglected during its lifetime to receive its illumination from its divine spirit, our personal God, then it becomes difficult for the gross and sensual man to survive for a great length of time of his physical death. And she be- believes that dogs can go to heaven. Oh. oh, hell yeah, like that movie. That's awesome. All Blavatsky <laughs> dogs go to heaven. It is enough to make one's feelings revolt against the claim justice of the first cause to believe that while a heartless, cold-blooded villain has been endowed with an immortal spirit, the noble, honest dog, often self-denying unto death that protects the child or the master he loves at the peril of his life, that never forgets him but starves himself on his grave, will be annihilated. Isis Unveiled is the product of an order from Blavatsky's secret brotherhood. 
her teachers, her masters, her mahatmas. She wrote it with Henry Alcott by her side, claiming to be writing about things she had never studied and quoting from books she had never read. So she was receiving it supernaturally. She was inspired by otherworldly forces, namely these occult masters who were sort of like projecting their intelligence to her. Her inspiration came from this secret crew of enlightened occultists. Alcott described the experience working with her on the book. Each change in the HPV manuscript would be preceded either by her leaving the room for a moment or two, or by her going off into the trance or abstracted state when her lifeless eyes would be looking beyond me into space, as it were, and returning to the normal waking state almost immediately. She sent Alcott to shelves to grab books and seemed to know exactly where to find the information she'd wanted. She'd name a page, and there Alcott would discover exactly the paragraph she was searching for. Alcott viewed his task writing the book as a kind of occult education in which Blavatsky was teaching him by challenging him to make contact with his own intuitive consciousness of occult truths. She caused me to utilize, it almost seemed, everything I had ever read or thought— and stimulated my brain to think out new problems that she put to me in respect to occultism and metaphysics, which my education had not led me up to, and which I only came to grasp as my intuition developed under this forcing process. She would write, cut up, paste, disassemble, cut, and paste again to form her argument. In addition to being her student, Olcott also served as her proofreader and her collaborator. I corrected every page of her manuscript several times, and every page of the proofs, wrote many paragraphs for her, often merely embodying her ideas, helped her find out quotations, and did other purely auxiliary work. The book is hers alone, so as personalities on this plane of manifestation are concerned, and she must take all the praise and all the blame that it deserves. It took Blavatsky two years to complete the book, starting in the summer of 1875 and finally publishing it in 1877. Her book wasn't the only occult manifesto to be published in America at the time. Less well-known but still significant was the Chevalier Louis de B's Art Magic. The Chevalier was a mysterious occultist who wrote under a pseudonym and shared Blavatsky's interest in Indian religion. Blavatsky and the Chevalier agreed on a series of key ideas expressed in both his book and hers. Blavatsky believed in the tripartite nature of existence, that we are matter, force, and spirit. She believed in a central spiritual sun, sort of a sun that's emanating spiritual energy as well as physical energy, and that elementary spirits exist and account for much of the phenomena produced by spiritualist mediums. Now, this is a hot take on her part. What she's saying there is that when the those mediums I mentioned earlier who were tapping out messages from the, the dead, the Long Island medium, she's not actually communicating with dead people. She's not really communicating with your grandmother. She's communicating with a nature spirit, like, you know, a fairy or a gnome who's just being a mm. trickster and is fooling the medium and the person the medium's talking to into believing that there's a dead person on the other end of the line. Ugh. That's gross. That's gross. Well, (laughs) part of her purpose was to replace spiritualism. She was trying to write her way into and theorize her way into a kind of innovation on spiritualism to move past spiritualism and into occultism, which seems like, why would you want to do that? But in the 1860s and 1870s, spiritualism was wildly popular. There were millions and millions of people who were into spiritualism. So if she could find a way to attract those people to her system, she was going to be made in the shade. Okay. She believes in the superiority of of the adept's will over the medium's passive trance, and perhaps most significantly, she believes in the existence of secret occult brotherhoods. From the first ages of man, the fundamental truths of all that we are permitted to know on earth was in the safekeeping of the adepts of the sanctuary. The difference in creeds and religion practiced was only external. And those guardians of the primitive divine revelation who had solved every problem that is within the grasp of human intellect were bound together by a universal Freemasonry of science and philosophy, which formed one unbroken chain around the globe. With her brotherhood, 
Blavatsky corroborated a significant part of the Chevalier's own story. Blavatsky believed in secret brotherhoods, just as the Chevalier's narrative relied on them uh, and the people who trained him in his art. The highest group of adepts that he encountered was in India at the caves of Elora. Uh, but Blavatsky shared another interest with the Chevalier, agreeing with him that there was a significant occult power to be found among the Fakirs. I'm sorry, what? The what? <laughs> The Fakirs, F-A-K, Ears, and also the Yogis of India. That brings us to today's brief history. The earliest civilization in India was the Indus, who were probably wiped out by the less culturally advanced but more militaristic Aryans about 4,000 years ago. Aryan Brahmins or priests composed the Vedas, a series of religious texts that formed the basis for Hinduism and all that's come before it. The text was memorized down to the accurate pronunciation of each syllable and then eventually committed to writing in the 14th century BCE. Neophytes trained for 12 years in the wilderness under a senior teacher, memorizing the Vedas and perfecting the details of ritual while tending the teacher's cattle. Uh, which is what I've had Savannah doing, actually, tending my cattle as my, my alchemical actor. How's that going, by the way? It sucks. Uh, I don't want to do it anymore. Oh, wait, no, I'm not not talking to you. I'm sorry. Uh, I love it. It's great. I love taking care of cows. Hmm. I'm suddenly worried about my cattle. <laughs> <laughs> Be Beginning from their base of operations in the Punjab, the Aryans spread eastward and assimilated otherwise hostile rival tribes into a single society stemming from a shared system of worship. Early Vedic religion focused a lot on sacrifice, also called yajna. Yajna was the central ritual of ancient Indian religion, blood sacrifices to Agni, Indra, and other gods always in the presence of the sacred fire. Humans, bulls, cattle, and a wide variety of other animals were sacrificed in order to achieve various forms of prosperity or victory in war. Does that raise a question for either of you, the sacrifice of cattle? Like a ethical question or like a educational question? <laughs> well, I mean, what is our association with cattle in India today? They're they're holy. Yes, yeah, and you're not allowed oh, to, right? So right. Th what we're looking at now is is a different system. The sort of the advent of vegetarianism and all these things are a modern version of of what we now call Hinduism. So the Vedic religion was very different and very much focused on sacrifice. It's the same sort of thing we see with Christianity and earlier Judaism. Christ was very upset at the sacrifices that were going on in the temple, remember? Yeah. And modern Christians, or even like the early church fathers, replace that with communion, which does not involve actual literal sacrifice. So in India, it's the same thing. We move from a culture of sacrifice to a culture of post-sacrifice. Mm. So the 6th century BCE has been called the Axial Age because so many significant systems of philosophy developed during the period. Many of the prophets of the Old Testament, Plato, Sophocles, Confucius, and Lao Tzu, as well as the founders of India's great religious philosophies all date to the 6th century BCE. Buddhism, Jainism, and the Upanishads instigated a big shift away from the Vedic sacrificial culture by introducing the doctrine of reincarnation. Individuals are reborn according to their actions or karma until liberation from rebirth is reached through moksha, which is another word for release or salvation. I like the that yogi, word. Moksha? Yeah. I just remember really liking that word a lot every time you bring it up. <laughs> Sounds like a delightful tea, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. <laughs> <laughs> tea that enlightens you. The yogi must realize the fundamental oneness of the individual soul or atman with the energy of the world or brahman in order to achieve this moksha, and this requires transcending the illusion that you are separate from all that surrounds you. And on your path to becoming a good yogi can also be accompanied by supernatural feats like being able to, to levitate, but you shouldn't focus on that because that would enhance your ego, you would get all a big head about it, uh, and then you wouldn't be able to achieve enlightenment. That makes sense. Man, there's so many rules. I just want to <laughs> levitate. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> the Upanishads elevated Vishnu and Shiva to the top of the Hindu pantheon, which included many thousands of gods, displacing Agni with his cult of blood sacrifice. Vishnu, the creator god, was known for his many incarnations, sending pieces or aspects of himself to earth to save humanity from its travails. Shiva, a powerful and paradoxical god, was the destroyer of the universe, but also a lover, being the god with a significant family life and the master of meditation as the patron of yogis. 
Traveling Brahmins, the only group in India at that time with a mandatory education, began assimilating tribes in the West by teaching basic agricultural trek techniques and transforming their tribal gods into incarnations of Vishnu or married partners of their Brahmanic gods. So they basically go from tribe to, you know, village to village, and the village would be like, this is my god, and they'd be like, no, it's not. That's just Vishnu dressed up like that uh, dwarf there. <laughs> They're like, what? Oh. What did you say <laughs> I, to me? I had no idea. Uh, in this way, the Brahmins organized all of India, or most of India, under their Hindu system. Uh, and that, my friends, is a brief history of Indian religion. Wow, that was very brief. It Was it? Like, considering, you know. I forgot <laughs> it was a brief history. Considering you just covered, like, you know, really, like, two <laughs> different true. religions. <laughs> Yeah, so we left out a lot of details there, but this is the basic overview there. And and we should I, I did that because Blavatsky is so in, interested in Indian religion. It's such a major influence on yeah. her system of theosophy. What I keep talking about this blend of East and West. I'm really talking about a blend of Indian religion and Western occultism. So she spoke in terms of akasa, which is an Indian occult element that matches up with what Western occultists might call the astral fluid. You guys know Ooh. this astral fluid? Uh, no. Sounds familiar for some reason, but well, uh, Olivia, what do you what do you what do you associate with astral projection? I mean, like going out of your body, you know. And there's and like a thing, beyond. like there's an aspect of you that's doing that, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, guess this it is, sense, but yeah. So in a, in Indian occultic terms, it would be that akasa force that's allowing you to make that projection. Oh, okay, I see. So by channeling Akasa energy into a seedling, you can also cause it to grow, flower, and die all in the space of an hour. Pretty cool. amazing. Wow. Well, that's... So you can use it for lots of things. Yeah. Blavatsky's biographer suggested that she met her first adept when an Indian delegation visited, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and her two most important masters, Kuthumi and Master Moria, she called Indian Brahmins. So you can see there's a lot of Indian influence. According to, so now the question might be, what is a Mahatma? Well, we've got to ask Blavatsky that question. And she says it's an occult adept who has transcended his physical being, but has continued to remain in contact with the physical world in order to elevate and enlighten humankind. So he's a force ghost? I don't know. Yeah, so like uh, Jesus. He's from Star Wars. Savannah, for those of those who are not up on their star lores, can you uh, let us know what that Jeez. A uh, for, <laughs> force ghost. I mean, I um, they as a person who has like died, but has like kind of become one with the force, and like can come back and talk to people and give guidance. Like the Obi Wan is the first one to do that, right? In the first seven yes. movies, yeah. Mm-hmm. He makes an appearance. Well, technically, uh, I'm sorry. Never mind. I'm gonna get in the Star Wars lore. Never mind. <laughs> technically, what? She's about to. Uh, technically, Qui Gon Jinn is the first person to do it, but he didn't finish his training before he died, so he only partly did it. And then Qui, I mean Obi Wan Kenobi is the first person to fully do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, yeah, Rob. <laughs> God. That's the. It's time for a Blavatsky quote. <laughs> At the time of his physical death, all the lower four principles perish without any suffering, for these are, in fact, to him, like a piece of wearing apparel, which he puts on and off at will. The real Mahatma is then not his physical body, but the higher manas, which is inseparably linked to the Atma and its vehicle. And whoever, therefore, wants to see the real Mahatma must use his intellectual sight. He must so elevate his manas that its perception will be clear and all mists created by Maya must be dispelled. But while the description and name of these enlightened beings is fairly Indian, Blavatsky's occult tutelage only seems to have happened outside the subcontinent in Cairo, where she made two trips in the 1850s, and Tibet, which by all accounts is the ultimate seat of her early knowledge. As Wouter Hanegraaff, a occultism scholar, points out, while the later secret doctrine delved into westernized Indian theology, Isis Unveiled was more rooted in an Egyptian hermeticism, far more popular with European occultists at the time. Blavatsky would really be a significant force, along in part with the Chevalier Lewis to be, for introducing the notion of Indian religion into the occult world. Before this, everyone was crazy about Egypt. And, and you, let's just look at the title, right? Isis Unveiled. 
you got your Egyptian goddess right in there. Well, wait, what year is this again? Uh, 1877. I got it. Why do you ask? <laughs> well, because, like, aren't people not obsessed with Egypt yet? Because, like, the tomb, like, the first tomb wasn't open yet, right? The tomb stuff isn't coming, but Egyptian, like, lore and hieroglyphs and oh, that the stuff notion of already... Egypt. Yeah, that's already circulating. Hmm. So, uh, you see, you're, you're thinking about Aleister Crowley, right? Well, I was just thinking about, like, 1923 isn't that when they like opened like tut's tomb for the first time and shit and that, i thought that like yes. made people obsessed with like it the whole but thing, even before but... then if if you look at like the occult revival and the outfits they wore and all that they loved the egyptian yeah stuff. you're right like alistair crowley kind of yeah for sure yeah. Uh, so, we need look no further than Blavatsky's about face on the subject of reincarnation to realize how Egyptian her earlier ideas were and how Indian her later ones became. Isis Unveiled did not support the doctrine of reincarnation despite its central place in the Upanishads. And then later with the sacred doctrine, she would pick that up. Reincarnation, i.e. the appearance of the same individual, or rather his astral monad, twice on the same planet is not a rule in nature, it is an exception, like the teratological phenomenon of a two-headed infant. It is preceded by a violation of the laws of harmony of nature and happens only when the latter, seeking to restore its disturbed equilibrium, violently throws back into earth life the astral monad which had been tossed out of the circle of necessity by crime or accident. Between 1877's Isis Unveiled and 1888's Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky gave up Egyptian occultism in favor of her own version of India, which she considered the true home of her Mahatmas. She professed belief in reincarnation and detailed a system of belief based on esoteric Buddhism, a kind of Vedic religion predating the earliest forms of Indian religion, which she identified as the only true religion. In 1878, Blavatsky and Olcott would sail for India on the steamship Canada and never look back. Blavatsky would only return near the very end of her life to Europe. This geographical change would give Blavatsky's subsequent occult theory and practice its westernized Indian focus and fundamentally reshape the nature and practice of modern theosophy and even arguably Western culture more broadly conceived by creating a never-before-seen synthesis of Eastern and Western perspectives. But we'll have to save that for another episode and perhaps a whole other season. Ooh... Olivia, bring us on home. I hereby adjourn and declare close this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors till such a time as we get together and do it again. Joining us for today's episode, we had Brandon Walls doing the voice of Henry Alcott and also Lucy Bond doing the voice of Helena Blavatsky. On the the mic for the discussion, uh, Savannah Verrett joining us uh, for the first time. Woohoo! Yay! Bye, everybody. Lovely to have you, Savannah. Thank you. I'm now a Helena Blavatsky stan. She seems like a really cool woman. Yes. Add that to the Mormons. (laughs) You have a growing list. Yes. (laughs) 19th century religious innovators. Uh, And Olivia Literal, our grandmaster. Bye, guys. Me, my name... It's been real. My name is Ralph C. Thompson. Uh, join us on our, uh, for our next episode uh, where we explore the mystery of the Chevalier Louis de B, uh, an occult figure whose identity has never truly been discovered. So it's not his name, Chevalier Ooh. Louis de B. Louis de B, the B is, has a period after. It's just the letter B. So we don't, we don't know what his name <laughs> is. It was a pseudonym uh, that uh, was ch- selected. F- he either selected it for himself or was selected for him by his publisher, Emma Harding Britton, and his editor. So uh, it's going to take us a couple episodes, actually, to get through the whole story of the Chevalier because it's so mysterious. But isn't that the fun of Occult Confessing? We'll catch you next time here on Occult Confessions.